I look, work with these Italians now. And my wife said, how will it go? And I said, we're going to get demolished. And because I looked at individuals and I, and I compared them in their positions and I said, which individual will make a super rugby side? <laughs> and it was like Parisi. And that's why I looked. Yet the unity and the belief or the, the fighting spirit of these Italians made them competitive. Fair. Yeah. 60, 70% yeah. of that squad has been playing more than five years together. And that, you know, they have a lot of senior players in that. No, actually, side. other way yeah, around. That game, it that game no, was young. What happened is the, the two years ago, the South African team that played them, there were only two players that remained in that team. Yeah. So we have no idea in that case how average Italy w was and I'm just honest with you mm. it wasn't that Italy was so good it was more South Africa that was really no, disorganized no. and poor uh, what did you, know, you focus on specifically because I mean I, I, we can't really take clips full of a game but you know what was what what were you guys targeting it does it was just like we worked at Saracens, which is, it's not about the result. It's about individually performing the best you can perform. And if that's good enough, great stuff. And if we lose a game and it's, and it's not good enough to get a result, no problem. Because it's about effort. It's not about the skill. So you take the fear of failure away because you cannot fail if you put effort in, you know. It's a very simple principle. Um, but it, it just works for them as well. They worked unbelievably hard. You know, the previous week they took 60 mm. against the All Blacks. And when I look at the video, I showed them and I said to Connor, <coughs> we were brilliant. Connor says, what do you mean brilliant? I said, they did everything we asked them to do. Look at them get up off the floor. Look at them chase their kicks. You know, I was so proud of them. And when we got into the video session on the Monday, that was, boys, I'm going to show you. I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to show you. And I showed them these clips. And I said, amazing. You go out to South Africa. That's all you do again. Mm. If it's good enough, it's good enough. You know? And then sometimes you do get into situations where the opponents, remember what we used to say at Saracens, um, we might not win every game. But if the other guy is slightly off his game, he will lose yeah. because we will never play poorly. Mm -hmm. We don't play poorly because our game is not built about a couple of uh, individual moments of brilliance. It's built around a group's work ethic and a group's discipline. Um, you know. I know. Well, I want to, you, you say that, but at least the one thing that, although you suck into your ways, we could always adapt. And how much of a northern hemisphere caught up with a with a southern hemisphere? And then, you know, for me personally, this is how I see it: early two thousands, late two thousands, like when we came over to Saracens, we still had advantage because the academy structures was only starting to be put in place in England and Ireland. By the time I left uh, Europe and you left Europe, the academy structures were running strong. And then suddenly they didn't need as many foreigners because their young, own young guys were coming up. I and agree. That is where they're catching us. I mean, I was the only guy when Faf de Klerk intercepted that, that try, try saving uh, pass. I was the only guy kicking a chair because I was betting an island to win it because I knew the young guys coming through and how they were catching up. There's no way you can put the team, team together in one week and, in, and catch up. But yeah. I mean, you yourself, you just finished. In terms of a product, how much have I caught up to Northern Hemisphere? No, absolutely. I mean, there's no difference. You can see it in the tests all the way England play. Uh, the, those young guys came through. They were 16, 17 year olds when mm. we arrived there. They, I mean, they've got crafted and trained by and coached by the best coaches, and in positions as well. If you look at a at a Jamie George is there now. You were there, senior player. Skulk was there. John Smith was there. It's the best thing he could have had, and he was patient. And now look where he is. He's probably still inexperienced in test caps but he's very experienced in where he's actually. So that's why the England team is actually doing the same with Owen Farrell. So those guys. It's professionally run and a structure's put in place. And it was like, and I remember the guy said, look, there's a lot of South African guys now, but in five, six years' time, I know the joke was they London, South Africa. And if you look at it now, there's hardly yeah. any South Africans mm. now. And but if you look at Owen, for instance, and Jamie would be a great example. Physical specimens, they definitely not. No. You know, Jamie is not, is, and Owen's the same. He's not yeah. particularly fast, doesn't have particularly good feet. But both of them have got something special. Yeah. They got, got fight inside of them, yeah. and they're brilliant decision makers. Yeah. So where did this decision making come? Experience. This is my point, experience. They stayed in the system. So when, when we started at Saracens, we actually changed the model. We said, we're not going to have a one-year academy system and spit them out. We said, let's make a little case study of this one. Let's stick to the boys. Yeah. So interesting. Jackson, Will. George, Owen, Jamie, all the guys, same yeah. people, we invested time. They weren't freaks. 
no. of nature. They weren't believe in Napolas. They weren't believe in no. which was a freak of nature. You know, they were actually average Joes, mm. but because they stuck to the system, they are now fantastic rugby players. So, and our, that's our problem in South Africa. 100%. We don't stick. That's to what our point kids. I was going to make, and that is why I believe we thought Northern Hemisphere caught up with us. That's why they will 100% pull away from us. Then we get to the scenario where Adam said, if a guy's not in a professional setup by the age of 23, I mean, to give you a good wow. example, Franz Ludeke was like that. If you play club rugby and didn't get a contract immediately after 21, he wasn't interested in you yeah. at, at all. And that is why I, I firmly believe that's, that's where we're going to fall further behind. Well, I got lucky with Franz, luckily, but um, he watched a club game and pulled me in eventually when I was at the Lions and was injured. But I think just another player that I think is a very good example and I know how frustrated he was was Ben Spencer yes. young player Richard Wiggles Neil Lecox sitting there older guys playing every game Ben not getting a chance but just working on it working on it now all of a sudden you put the guy in but you see the interesting yeah. thing is like when when I went to Italy now the one thing Europeans do it does which is not doesn't come from me and London Irish who I'm involved in at the moment got an unbelievable extras culture yeah. end of a training session yeah. the hookers throw the wings catch high balls. The locks do kickoffs. You know, you remember Steve Borthwick. Mm. He's always out there. Mm. Even Mo. Remember Mo couldn't catch a cold. <laughs> Playing to you know? all day long. <laughs> and you just kick and kick and kick and kick. So, we look at us. We come off the field. We're young. We're 22, 23. How's that happening? Nobody stays out there. Yeah. The yeah. Italians. We, I have to say to them, boys, you have to come in now. We're going to have too much time on our legs. You know, the week is short. And I think, so there's a lot of little things like that where we've not grown up with a culture of work mm. because we're so good. Genuinely, we've got physical specimens that mm. run over people, run around people. They've got natural feet. And if they learn to work, those physical specimens, there's a kid at Paul Riss last year. His name is Damien Willemsa, mm. a little yeah, fly hop. Yes, I tell you, he played two years South African schools. Yeah. If they manage that kid correctly, he could honestly be a world beater. Okay, Big. Man. He's got, hey, Ari, Absolutely. that kid is. Absolutely. But the question is, will we sit in, 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 a, in a place like this in five years' time and say, yeah, but he didn't make it. Where yeah. is he playing? Out for Salori's Pass Village or somewhere out there, you know, Belar Club or something, you know? And yeah, what will your fear be that they take and they all of a sudden put him at the age of 19 in a Stormers team? Because you don't want that either. You want the guy to probably you see, work on his craft a bit. And I, I think... What Edda said earlier for me is we must figure a way out to not chop and change the whole time. When yeah. he has the bad game, yeah. the bad runner games, we shouldn't say, no, you see, not good enough. He yeah. doesn't have temperament because that's our sickness in South Africa. We take people and spit them out. And I remember Owen going through a patch where he just played poorly. He made bad decisions. He kicked the ball poor out of hand. But there's no one else. Yeah. You know, I remember myself going to Free State. So there was an old coach there called, called him Tat Bueta, who coached all of us. <laughs> Tat. I'm Tati, you know. If you, were from, if you were from the Lions, and he was always the central regions yes. on the 21 guy, to make SA on the 21s was pretty tough oh, because yeah. he will go pick a third team Corsair's guy yeah. and yeah. put it in the old place before he picks a guy from the Lions. Exactly. So, but um, Tati, and he got me to come to Bloemfontein. And you know what? I remember being off form, things going wrong, but he stuck to me. Mm. And, and in the free state, they stuck to the people because mm. there aren't just another one <laughs> yeah, to go and take. Another one. You know? And then look how many free state spring mucks there were. Yeah. That's why free state are so good. Yeah. Uh, you know, is this belief, <coughs> stick to it, you know? But I believe what I'm asking, Damien, do you go and then put him in a Stormers team at the age of 19? Do you hold him back? Do you say, we're going to put you in there and we're going to stick yeah. with you? Or do you still... The problem is the Stormers don't have a dominant fly half. Mm. So there is a chance. And I actually think Damon Willems is that good. You mm. know, you have the Tim Horrens and the Jason Littles. There's always in a generation, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Matt O'Connor, that came through that were very young yeah. because they're just so talented. Uh, if you but look did they at not Jordan, have great seniors around there? No, valid point. That's a very valid point. And they they were be. nursed and, and looked after. And Carla Kerr and Bosch. Um, Initially, I thought they, they really did well in terms of not exposing him to Super Rugby too early. He played that last game of Super Rugby and then obviously he was a start to every game in, in the Curry Cup. Um, there's, not, there's not really a way of protecting a, a special talent like that, is there? Um, how much do you know of him, Harry? Um, I saw him in the under-20s. And that was basically, I saw him obviously playing a few, few games for the Sharks. Yeah. But I don't know a lot about him, obviously, being away for a while, I didn't know his background or... Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, 
I think he's very talented. He, he kicks the ball a mile. That's his yeah. biggest point of difference. He's fast as well, but he is small, it does. And he is a little bit gun shy. You know, so um, he's been gun shy since he, he, he was at school because he was a small guy. So much so that they used him at fullback. He was a flyer for Great PE. And they started playing him at fullback and they started hiding him in defensive situations in fullback, you know. Now, to answer your question, that's a problem because Damien Willemse is not gun shy. You know, he is actually too courageous. He, yeah, you know, but he, like Fez, Fez is not a big yeah, lad and Dam- he smashes the oak. Yeah, not small, yeah. but Damien is not, he's also fairly no, he's big. He's a big guy, yeah, but he likes the confrontational side. Yeah. So my point is just that rugby in the end is a confrontational physical game and you can't hide people in rugby. You know, you try and hide them, it's not going to work. So go and Bosch, let him go through the ranks and make him a fullback. Damien Willemse, or make him a fly off like Nas Boto was. You know, they mm. couldn't catch Nas anyway. Mm. Brendan, I just quickly want to ask you about golf April. And I, mean, I like an underdog story. I distinctly remember how he won the game for Durbanville Belleville single handedly against Rustenburg. I heard there was a bit of discipline issues in a carry cup, and that's why he, has, he didn't really feature in the past carry cup. Is it something that he can work on? Are we going to see him again? That's actually my main question. Because um, I, I thought he was a guy with a couple of years in a system, he could perhaps show a bit of, bit of promise. See, he would be a great example in the previous model that very talented, I think he played South African schools, um, but then didn't go through a system, uh, it does. So when he came up, nobody knows him. He's got amazing feet, he's he's lightning fast. But three or four games, then they know the step. That's how it works in professional rugby. You know, there's not Rosenberg, you have a good game. Um, And the other thing is, it's the same. Defensively, he is incredibly poor. So he gives yards. You know, and the question is, you know, if you're a cricketer and you can't deal with a short delivery, everybody bowls short at you. Mm. If you struggle defensively once, they go for you, you know. So for me, that's probably the point. Can we find a, a way, which you said earlier, to keep these kids in the system that when they get exposed, I think Garth is going to be spat out and Garth is going to move around if somebody doesn't stick to it. You know, and I don't think Goss is that Goss is a 10. I think Goss is going to be a 15 if he's going to play because defensively, you can stay on your feet and defend differently. But there's nowhere to hide if you're a 10. That is the channel most attacked in world rugby. So, uh, especially you know, if you're weak. Especially if they perceive you to be a weakness. Yeah, then they're, yeah. Just they're going to look for you. You know. But in, in terms of a, you know, everybody reads the step. I remember distinctly, Andre Pollard. Remember when he beat the All Blacks on Alice Park? Also, like to step off his left, and you know, that's yeah. he scored against All Blacks. He did exactly the same against Ireland. Again, I suspected we were going to lose that game. Sean O'Brien was waiting. They knew he was going to do it. Yeah. Ran straight into it. They turned him over three times on our own on, on the goal line. Why does he get away with it? Is it because he's maybe a bit of bigger player, better defender? Um, you understand where I'm going? I, I don't think it's necessarily just a step. I think it's your first season is probably almost your, your yeah. always your easiest season because mm-hmm. no one knows you. So you, rugby is a weird thing. If your name's not mentioned uh, in the opposition team room on a Thursday or Friday, it's kind of you've forgotten. But the next year, all of a sudden, people know about it and they go, look, we've got we to watch out for this kid. And all of a sudden, there's a tension on you. And that just that little bit of attention makes it will the difference of all of a sudden now these guys know if you run they've got to keep a close eye on you yes you have the step and if you can do a good step it's hard to tackle but if the guys are aware and they know about it all of a sudden the focus are more on you and it becomes a little bit more, more harder that's why you see a lot of guys first season brilliant second season people go well he's not that good anymore but it's just you almost you either adapt or you the experience take you further but it's hard there's the transitional phase and, and if you look at somebody like Israel Falau who is most probably for me one of the three most talented rugby players I've ever seen in my life. Mm. A tall guy, his aerial skills are unbelievable. He's got brilliant feet. He can offload. In his second season, as Harry said, he's just not there. Yeah. You know, it's, it's amazing. He still has a go, but they just close him down. Mm. You know, just things don't happen. You know, even Sonny Bill, who was amazing, you know, it's just they figure you out. So as a rugby player, you have to learn another trick. Yeah. And that's also going to be, for me, the challenge in the Lions this year. Yep. Because yeah, they were 100%. new, you know, and Ruan Kombrink uh, attacked and, you know, he'd step back and he'd cut through and, and Ruan Janssen van Rensburg would do the same. Now people are going to study them. They're going to respect them. They're going to say their go forward comes from this guy, this guy, this mm. guy, and this guy. For me, it feels like Saru is killing our domestic game. They're not. They only. They marketing only the Springbok brand. They worry about the Springbok brand, and our Curry Cup is getting diluted, almost. 
where I personally feel like the more players you have, the better. And I, I want to show a clip quickly where they speak to basically a CEO of, of rugby development in in, uh, in New Zealand. And I want to, you, you probably haven't heard this, but just, just have a listen to what he says. If you want to have a, a lot of good cream, you've actually got to produce a lot of milk. Uh, so we're trying to get as many kids uh, playing as possible. And so we've actually spent considerable time talking to the kids um, and asking them what they like and what they want rather than getting an adult view of the world, which is what happens when you talk to parents and teachers and uh, the adults and the thing. And the kids actually have a really different view from what the adults have um, about what this is all about. And, and ultimately for the kids it boils down to fun and enjoyment. That's what they're after. Uh, they're not actually, when you talk to them, thinking that they're going to be all blacks. Um, so you constantly hear this, it's every Kiwi kid's dream of being an All Black. They might play at being an All Black, but the, the dream of being an All Black is an adult's view we've found looking back. The kids want to have fun, splash around in the puddles, be with their mates. And so we try and create, or help create that environment and, and drill down further into what do they mean by fun and, and what is enjoyable. So meaningful competitions, um, really good skill development, um, coaches who are going to make them better uh, and above all not taking it all too seriously. Um, the kids have got that, they're happy um, and if they're happy they'll continue to play and enjoy it. A meaningful competition isn't winning by 100 or losing by 100 when you talk to the kids. Um, even the teams that win by 100, the kids get bored with it. It's often the couple of superstars who score all the tries and the other 13 kids go well Coach is just making me shovel the ball onto the fast guy and the way he goes and he, he finishes the game with 10 tries and you know, thinks he's, he's, he's it. Um, so that's not fun, so trying to uh, work on the coaches um, to make sure that you know, if there's going to be a score blowout they do something about it. It's not about not winning and not striving to win, but trying to get some, some balance in there. We've brought in some stuff so that every kid, no matter who, gets half a game. Um, it's not universally accepted by uh, all of the coaches who are absolutely determined to win the local under 10 competition, uh, which, is, which apparently is really important. Um, but when you, when you talk to the kids, the one thing they don't like is going to training twice a week and then getting 10 minutes of garbage time on Saturday. They've signed up to play rugby, not to go and train for rugby. So we've got to make it um, available to them and let them play. We're trying to get more teams and more clubs to, um, especially at the lower grades, pick three even teams rather than an A, B and C team and having all the guns in the A team and the, the average players in the B and the, the, the no hopers in the C because at a young age, you don't know how many of those no hopers are actually going to come through. The A team will win easy um, and the players don't actually develop their skills and all that when they win easy. Um, again, not universally accepted at all. Um, but we're still working towards it and, and keep trying to put the message out there that give these kids good coaching, give them a fun environment, give them a good competition, we'll keep them in the game for longer. And, and rugby's a late developing sport. So let's um, keep these kids going and let's see who, who comes out. I think you guys have been to Christchurch Boys High. Luke Romano, who's currently all black lock and not a bad footy player, was in the third 15 there. So someone kept him going, even though he wasn't in the A teams and the first teams, gave him a love of the game and he carried on playing when he left school, developed, and he's now been in the All Blacks for several years. Yeah, I want to leave it, and that's actually the last bit that I also wanted to point out, and Ari, you can come in here. And do we have the structures in place for those no opus to stay in a game, Brendan? And because we've got such a big country, and especially in terms of develop, developing players, are we doing enough in those areas to try and, and, and get those players, the guys that are not going to your Paul Ruiz or your office or your Grey to come through? I believe, I, mean, I might be wrong, but I believe there's, I mean, the guys are scout, scouting quite a lot nowadays at smaller schools. And yes, you fast tracked it if you're in the good schools because you've got a professional outfit, and you train professionally, eat, and it's going to probably be harder for the guy in the small little platelance or dorpy to, uh, to get recognised and noticed. The good thing is I, I see they televise amateur club games now and you might get one or two gems out there and that's a great thing but the earlier statement you made is about you can never have enough professional players. I, I kind of disagree with you because 
I think there's a lot of guys. I think if you can have an amateur strong structure, we guys still have the opportunity to work and craft that side of their life and play rugby and get noted on TV and then maybe go that way around. Brent, I don't know if you, you might disagree with me here. That might be good because I'm, I'm sitting and I spoke, Mark Evans is actually the guy that mentioned that. He said a lot of guys get professional contracts at smaller unions and they get 10,000 rand uh, a month f- till the age of 30. And all of a sudden, they've got nothing because they played rugby and they might have had this false hope that they're going to make it and they played for a small union. That guy is a disciplined, great human being yeah. that could have added so much to a company if that false hope of just pushing him into a rugby direction and giving him 10,000 rand a month wasn't there. If that guy maybe crafted um, himself towards a, a career and still played rugby on the side and that gets televised and people actually use it as a tool where they can actually go and fetch players, then he would have been better off. Um, am I totally wrong? You or? Oh, I 100% agree with you. I and think <coughs> the biggest problem is we miss the point of playing rugby. Yeah. We don't understand. That the object of rugby was like-minded people, like a club, people who like playing bowls, mm. or like-minded people that get together on a weekend mm. in the evenings and they train together. They got the same interest. That's the object of it. I'll give an example. When I played at Western Province, I came down for a season and there was a coaching change. So, so um, um, Alan Solomons recruited me and Gerd Small took over from Alan Solomons and I was, you know, surplus to requirements. And, um, and I still had a contract. So I wanted to play and I actually enjoyed the game. And there was a local coloured club where I live, Strand uh, Licha. And uh, I went to them and I said, look, I'm the only white here. Can I play for you? So I play for the Springboks. I said, it doesn't matter. You know, I liked rugby. And um, I cannot tell you, it does. how many of those people now are still my friends. I bump into them. I took two of them to Bermuda with me, yeah. you know, and Nathan and Gershwin. And we just stayed friends. They are 100% yeah. we were like-minded. They bump in. They come yeah. and say, Budgie, you know, and I'm saying that's the object. You must do that at school. You must do that under 10. You're playing rugby to have friends. We did that at Saracens. We said the object 100%. is memories. There is no other object of the exercise, you know, the winning. Now, to come back to Aaron's point, it does, I can't agree more. There are definitely too many professional players because remember, we are giving them the carrot that they can earn 15,000. It's almost like giving um, a wild animal food. You're taking his drive away. That's why you're not supposed to feed a wild animal. It's just like a rugby player. Mm. Say to him, look, buddy, you can play rugby at this level, but you have to earn a living in the day. And you can do that. Why are you playing rugby? And if you don't want to play, there's no problem. And, and I think that'll make a, make a big difference. We cannot sustain those salaries. It's as simple as that, it does. There's not enough money. It's not just the Lions. It's not just the, 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 the cheetah, oh, I mean, the, the Western Province team now. It's the, the Sharks. They don't have money either. The Bulls don't have money. You know, the only one who's got money is the Cheetahs, and it's just because they've got a smaller budget. Yeah. They just don't overspend. But and also, that, before you go, just adding to that is... The guy, the late bloomer, who plays amateur rugby, and if the stuff is televised, like now, will get picked up. 100%. And, and then they don't get... want to come in. I'll give you a great example. A guy called Leon Duplessis plays for Impala. I mean, the Leopards are begging that guy to play for him, begging uh-huh. him, absolutely begging him. And unfortunately, uh-huh. he just goes, I'm a good, I've got a good engineer's job yeah. uh, with Impala. Yeah. I mean, and he will, he will walk into that Northwest team. Yeah. But it kind of, when I said earlier, the amount of, of, of professional players and, and it fits into my point where I said I feel like Saru is killing the local game if you look at a community cup and Dwayne Heath has done a phenomenal job he's the guy that's been pushing it they played in Boerland Welcome Rovers played in Boerland there were 6,000 people it's amazing now suddenly if you imp- like if we market our local game more push the guys down like we did at the Sharks to go play club rugby mm. that's a tangible hero now a guy in an underprivileged area that could play you could you know, rise out of his, his circumstances becoming a rugby player. He, now I can see that local player, a tangible hero. You know, so where, if a guy plays for the Bulls and he watches on TV, it's mm. a bit, the reach is a bit too far. Mm. And that's what I mean by killing our local game. I feel we can endorse our local game a bit more and grow it more for, for our, own, our own benefit. Yeah, no, I agree with that, it does. You know, um, we, we need to look at it differently. Uh, we can't keep doing the same thing and expect a yeah. different result. Yeah, yeah insanity. Yeah. Hmm. Quickly want to... <coughs> Talk about the Saracens game on the weekend before we run out of time. You know, Brendan Finter is a doctor, he has to go save lives. The new rules that came in on the start of the year, the, the high tackling rules, and we saw what Richard, I don't know if you guys know yet, Richard's been clear, Barrington. 
Brad is three weeks. Brad, uh, Brad is three weeks. Let's quickly, I'll just look at five seconds of it here. Brent, I don't know if we want to lean over. Oh, I saw You've that. seen it. Yeah. Uh, but quick play there. I mean, how, how, are we gonna, how are we gonna stop that process where it's almost like the referees. They, they always go to go, the TV ref always goes, mm. I concur with you. They're gonna have to get a system where you can kind of overrule him and say, listen, it was Brad Barrett's arm that knocked him out and mm. he fell into the shoulder of, of Richard it's, Barrington. It's hard because like all new rules in rugby, in the beginning when they yeah. apply it, it's always extreme. Remember when they changed the release uh, rule where you the, the tackle had release and then it, uh, I mean the Lions played against the Chiefs I think the score was 76 to 67. That's right. Yeah. You know, it looked like touch rugby and then all of a sudden it, it kind of mellowed back and that's the same with us and if you look at it it's, it's bad contact but if you are in a defensive structure where you double hit and the inside tackle is a leg tackle mm. and, the, and, the, and the second guy hits the ball then I mean that's going to happen a lot because the guy's going to get leg chopped his head's going to dip and you're going to think you're going to hit the ball and all of a sudden you hit the head yeah. um, but it's one of those exactly the same ones where probably 10 weeks in the season that probably might have just been a yellow card but in the beginning when they have new rules it's always extreme well, for me the most relevant thing was um, we always think we have to solve something when you look at a problem i.e. concussion you know we need to solve it mm. but the one guy got knocked out for hitting somebody's hip he was the tackler mm. he died at the hip i remember people running into a knee the, in other words the tackler getting knocked out because we keep looking at the people person being tackled yeah but it's definitely dangerous flying at people's knees mm -hmm. so you know oh, what are you going to do are you going now all of a sudden we as defensive coaches we normally say to people what are you natural at doing are you a uh, a chopper or a chester because mm. Eddie you would be a chester you're taller mm. you were sh are shorter you'd be a chopper I was a chester huh? then I didn't like you it wanted you wanted to be a chester <laughs> you thought you were <laughs> you thought you were yeah. but let really, me get the videos yeah. on here for you but the point being well, you do what comes naturally yeah. to you you know and now we actually say to somebody all these chesters must become leg tackles yeah. you know I just think it's gonna there's, uh, this is not the last we've seen of this no. thing no right? but it's, a, it's like you said I've got my most injuries all my neck injuries because of tackling definitely yeah. because someone tackled me yeah. so and, tackled and stealing someone. the ball yeah, yeah. Exactly. Did, you, did you knee I, yeah. I remember distinctly that scream on the TV when I cleaned you out you just yeah. came back from your, your yeah. knee injury yeah Well, thank you, gentlemen. We don't have a lot of time left. Adams, thank you again for coming. And Thanks, Etienne. Brendan, I 100% know if, a show, uh, if there's a future for the show, you guys will definitely be on here. Go. I've got a lot of points we didn't even get to. But yeah, thanks a lot, guys. It does. Okay. It's a pleasure talking to you, like always. Thanks. All right.